I will as an approval addict. So I'm on a ranch, 10 days, 100 guys, and Jay, it was all about feedback. I hated feedback, right? I didn't want to get feedback. I was delusional about how great I was, right? <laughs> Optimism and delusion sleep in the same bed together. Well, guess what? I wasn't getting approval from anybody, and I could literally feel it. My man, Chris, it's so nice to see another gentleman in a suit. You're looking real sharp. <laughs> I'm loving it. Nice, crisp white. You've got this. Uh, we were talking off air about a whole bunch of stuff, and I was so excited for us to jump into this thematic discussion about forgiveness and, and your story and everything else is going on in your life. But to begin, you sent me this quote that I, I, I'm kind of interested in. I think our feel-good father is going to love it. It's, we're a miracle and a mess at the same time. So what, what's that mean, man? Yeah, I, I, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of get into my story a little bit. But, you know, I, I think we get programmed as kids that we shouldn't make mistakes. Uh, you know, we, 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 have to be, we have to be perfect. You know, comparison is such a, a nasty thing, especially in society always, and especially today with social media. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time, like, beating ourselves up and, you know, I, I should be this and I shouldn't be this and we should all over ourselves. Right. And, and, and it's just, man, it's, just, and I just talk a lot about, you know, I don't think it's time management. I think it's energy management. And I think we have energy leaks. And one of them is, I believe, you know, public enemy number one is judgment and it's judgment of others, especially judgment of ourselves. And I spent decades you're not good enough. You're not this. You're not there yet. You're just this constant thriving and, you know, there's no happy ending to an unhappy journey. And I just, I, I just, I spent a lot of time in judging myself and God, you know, that's, that's a flaw and that shouldn't be this way. And you're an idiot and you're that. And then my life started transforming Jay when I was like, dude, you're a miracle and you're a mess. And there's messy parts of us. And if perfection is a form of self-sabotage, and if we're trying to get perfect, dude, it's just, we're not going to get there. Um, should we get better? Should we grow? Should we improve? Absolutely. But when I started accepting and loving the good side and the messy side, right, and really got back to really loving myself 100%, like, Things change. So that's what I mean by it's a miracle and a mess. We are. And we're forever going to be that way. We should try to get better. We should strive to get better. But the more we accept ourselves, the, the better the journey is and the more impact we can make for others. One of the core you know, tenets of the Feel Good Father is, is this idea of you know, this radical, radical ownership, this radical self-acceptance this radical pursuit of, of being the best that you can. And so it's super great that this is the discussion that we're having now. How did this, before you hit this point, how did this manifest in your life? The lack of approval and acceptance. Oh yeah, buddy. Um, well, I was an approval addict. Mm. Have you heard of approval addiction? <laughs> uh, for the feel-good fathers that that don't, can you? Yeah, can yeah. You I mean, uh, approval addiction. I mean, and, and studies show that you know, uh, 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 approval addiction. The brain lights up. It's it's like a heroin addiction. Uh, you know, whatever addiction. The the approval addiction of other people. And so basically, you know, during our lives you know, when we're kids, getting the approval of our parents serves us well. And that, that, I mean, all this makes sense. Like I think of from the, from the evolutionary physiology perspective, right? It kind of makes sense that you want other people to be happy that you're around, right? That means you're surviving in a thrive, you're in the, sorry, in the tribe, you're sharing resources. So this, this, this tracks keep going. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we get approval, we get the car, we get approval, you know, we, so, so we become full-blown approval addicts and it 
it works if you follow a traditional path, like being an employee and doing what the masses do and all that. But when you break out to, hey, I'm going to be a professional athlete, I'm going to be a musician, I'm going to be an artist, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and leave my CPA path behind that was safe and comfy, and I'm going to do something drastically different, then it's, you know, it's like the, the, the crab trying to crawl the bucket, right? People are going to pull you back and they're, they're protecting you, um, but, the, but they're in full-blown judgment. And if you're in, if you're in sales like me, um, it can crush you, right? Because you're, you're looking for the approval like a heroin addict's looking for heroin. And if you don't get it, it's devastating. And you take that on, and then what happens? You go back to comfort. You don't want to do it. And we can talk further about it because I, I have, like, the story of when I woke up on it. Um, but I, I think you want to say something around that. I, I was thinking about, you know, the feel-good father, about, you know, he's in this world – He's, he's following the path. He's, he's conforming, he's fitting in, he's, he's doing the work. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of them out there, right? If we take the basic statistics of, you know, earnings, right? You know, if you're, uh, no matter where you're at, right, you're going to be wh wherever you land, you're going to be doing the best you can. So if you're minimum wage, barely making it, you know, 10 to nine, doing your own contractor thing figuring out all the way up to business owner, right? You're, you're doing what you got, but it sounds like there is that there's a certain level of releasing this need for approval that would be really useful at all stages of that. I mean, for lack of a better word, socioeconomic ladder. I mean, is that something that, that you think about something that you, you teach on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, because I mean, so, so let me, I think my story illustrates it, right? So, and we can kind of get in the full story when it makes sense. But, but I was, I was at a 10 day men's seminar and I was, once again, I was a full blown approval addict and I didn't even know I had a problem. Right. And, and, and let me illustrate a, a study that my, my mentor, Steve Siebel did. He interviewed 25,000 people that had quit sales, direct sales, whatever, 25,000 people. Okay. And he asked them, do you have an approval addiction problem? 0.2% said they did. 0.2% said they did. Even though that was the reason they quit sales. They didn't even know it was a problem. So I didn't know I was an approval addict. So I'm on a ranch, 10 days, 100 guys, and Jay, it was all about feedback. I hated feedback, right? I didn't want to get feedback. I was delusional about how great I was, right? <laughs> Optimism and delusion sleep in the same bed together. Well, guess what? I wasn't getting approval from anybody. And I could literally feel it, right? I could feel it because I need my addiction. I need people to tell me I'm great. I need people to tell me I'm all that in a bag of chips. And and, and so we, we finished, we did this 48 hour service project where we were up and we, we did this, this lineup and all the men came by and we acknowledged each other just by looking in the eyes. I mean, it was very powerful. I mean, I, dude, this was mm -hmm. shoot 14 years ago, 15 mm -hmm. years ago, still remember it. And I'm like, oh my Lord, I never got my dad's approval totally popped up. So then we <laughs> went back, we slept for a few hours and then we kind of had the lineup with the facilitators and this world-class guy, transformational. He walked up, he's like, what, what are you getting out of this? I'm like, I have a tremendous need for the approval of other people. He said, it's exhausting to watch you try to get everyone's approval. And then he asked me a question, I get goosebumps every time I think about it. Then he asked me a question, it changed my life. He said, who pays the price for that? O M G J literally dominoes. I'm like, Oh my God, I overspend to look great, to look mm -hmm. a certain way. 
That's why I'm $250,000 in credit card debt. Um, my first marriage failed because I had their approval, right? So since I have your approval, I'm good. You stay there. Stay there. I need to go out here and get everyone else's approval. So what happens when you don't pay attention to your spouse? She's out the door. But I need this person's approval, this person's approval, right? Often fed, never satisfied. Dude, it just, I mean, it just lined up. I didn't ask for, I didn't ask for uncomfortable things. I didn't want to have uncomfortable conversations. I didn't want to have uncomfortable conversations with, with my, my spouse at that time. And I was just, oh my God, man. And then one of my favorite quotes is your, your need for approval is the biggest check you'll ever write in your life. And it was true. It was true. I, because I, I, my, my performance was down and anyway, we could talk for hours on it. My, my buddy does a, a whole day workshop on it, but it, man, it was uh, from a number standpoint, I wish I could, could point like I got it here and then here's what happened. I mean, it was, and it's not about getting rid of it because you're never going to get rid of it and, and you should, you, sh you should still want some of that. It's just, you know, it works until it doesn't. And for me, it went a, a totally different direction. And, and I still have it, um, but now I'm aware of it, right? And I'm, I'm in a pretty aggressive launch thing right now. I'm not getting everyone's approval, right? <laughs> and, so, and so now I'm so aware of it, right? Now I'm like, oh, there you are, little friend, right? But you're not going to control me today. I'm still going to move forward. I'm still going to take action. So it's just awareness of when things run you that don't serve you. And what do you do to interrupt the pattern? to do something different and shift. So hopefully that all made sense, what I just said. It, it really reminds me as you're talking about this thing that happened to you 14, 15 years ago and how the hard work doesn't stop, right? The, the, the pains that incur that even the self the self inflicted ones are the, are the worst ones, ones that are invisible. Um, that they are the most painful and the hardest to overcome. Uh, I absolutely love this. I know feel good fathers are going to be are, are are really liking it. I'm I'm loving when you're talking about standing on your own two feet. That's what that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing stand on your own two feet. Like understand who you are. And it's it's so interesting because I've got Marvel's registration, right? The protection of everybody. And then I got and I was thinking about Captain America the whole time. Like both, you know, Chris Evans in the movie, but just, you know, the video game character, the comic character, the whole deal, and just how there was just element of, you know, part of it is the, um, uh, you know, the background of who checks the checker, right? Who, who, from Captain America's perspective, there's, there's issues in the system. There's, you know, there's the service of the, of the greater good. Um, but then there's also the, the recognition, which is a very, very much aligned with a lot of the X-Men story of um, Magneto's story, right? You're, you're going to be tagged. You're going to be cataloged. We're going to know where you are. You're going to be, you know, we're going to, we're going to surveil you for the rest of your life and how there's that principle that Captain America has and even Magneto to an extent. So both, you know, good side, bad side um, of just, you know, I don't need your approval. This is the right thing. This is the right thing. And I think of when I think of people that overcome this, when I think of the feel good fathers as they transition away from just trying to build, just trying to earn the money, just trying to do that kind of stuff. And they turn, they start facing their family and they start facing their community and they start building the next thing. It's not even about like, it's not about I need your approval. It's like, I, I want to build this thing. I want my family to be better. I want myself to be better. I want my kids to have a better life. And we do that through community. So, um, I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> tell, tell me this story. <laughs> oh, the story. Okay. Yeah. My, my, yeah. Yeah. My story. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in, I'm in Colorado. So I grew up in, uh, Loveland, which is like 60 miles North of Denver to, you know, uh, two great parents did the best they could, but they, you know, argued over money, fought over money, stressed over money, divorced over money, kind of did that. Mm. My mom passed away, you know, way too early at 64 colon cancer. My dad made it all the way to 88 and, and they said, Hey, you know, go to school, get good grades, 
get a good job, get good benefits, don't rock the boat, don't take risk. And when you're 65, everything's going to be sunshine, lollipops, and roses. And uh, we know that model's pretty broken. But went to Colorado, Colorado State University, got an accounting degree, and then moved down to Denver in 1993. Went to work for what was then the largest accounting firm in the world at that time called Arthur Anderson. And they were a great firm. Then they met Enron, and then they were no longer a great firm. Um, they went out of business. But but basically, I uh, you know was climbing the corporate ladder, working 70, 80, 90 hours a week. And... And had a you know a very difficult uh, client. Uh, I worked 120 hours in a six day period, and uh, you know got this job done. Came home Saturday night. It was it was the, the night before Easter Sunday? And my mom's like, "You're not working Easter Sunday, or I shoot you right. Like you're gonna be here." So I, I came home at 11 o'clock at night. And my brother was up and. You know, when you've worked 120 hours, a six day period, you want to go to bed. He wanted to have a family intervention. So he's just like, he's like, dude, what up? Are you a drug dealer? Are you, did you get kidnapped? And he kind of got in my kitchen and, and, you know, Jay, we're, we're hypnotic robots and 91% of our thoughts today are the same as they were yesterday. And, um, he woke me out of this hypnotic trance I was in. And he got me to do the thing I didn't want to do, which, as you know, is the hardest work on the planet, and that is thinking. And so the next day I sat down and I thought for the first time since I was probably a little kid of what do I really, 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 really want my life to look like? Um, and it's, you know, and, and, you know, everybody wants to get all the personal development gurus are like, hey, you got to get clear. You got to get clear. You got to know what you want. Got to know your why. And we're always good at, yeah, 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 I'll do that tomorrow. And, and I did it. And I got real excited, but then I got depressed because I looked at being an employee. And for me, being an employee was just, it wasn't, I wasn't going to get it done. So I kind of went on this entrepreneurial search, landed on uh, being a financial services entrepreneur with the firm I'm with still to this day. Uh, kind of moonlighted, worked 70 hours a week over there, worked six to 10 hours a week over here for about a year made a grand total of $8,000 my first year, spent the majority of my time talking people out of doing business with me and, and then launched, uh, you know, February 2000, so almost 20 or over 23 years ago. <clears throat> and, um, you know, was married, had, you know, kids. And then that marriage, you know, ended because of a lot of my issues I'm kind of, I'm, I'm interested. I'd, I'd like to know, um, you're building, you're striving, you're going, you've had this major, you've had a career transition. Yeah. I, I'd like to, you know, stick in it. Sure. What were the impacts of this on your, on your, on your marriage? Um, well, I mean, it was, it was, it was significant. I mean, because I mean, literally, because I mean, I got married, we got pregnant and I resigned from, you know, I was on partner track for the largest firm on the planet. And uh, well, that's a tough conversation to have. Yeah. Well, to, to her credit, she always believed in me and supported me. And her dad's uh, probably one of the best entrepreneurs Colorado's ever seen. And, and he, he always had my back too. So, so that was, you know, that was really good. Um, so, so I had, I had their support. But once again, I mean, being driven by, I got to get this to work, combination of having, having a bad relationship with money, right? Mm -hmm. She was a spender then. And mm -hmm. so I was always out running the bill collector, right? And we're entering, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, which in my industry, that was, those are pretty nasty times. And I'm not mm -hmm. that good at what I was doing, right? But... I did have a tremendous amount of desire and I wanted to prove that I could and I, I wanted to prove others wrong. And that was kind of my, kind of my juice, but yeah, no, uh, she was low priority and it didn't work for lots of reasons, but I didn't pay attention. I'm like, I'll get to you. I'll get to you once we're safe financially. 
I can see, I can see the feel good father either having experienced or worked through or currently in this kind of situation of, um, so many of us as fathers have this not only self-imposed, but societally imposed, um, requirement to maximize the income coming in and uh, the world wants us to do it in general our wives want us to do it we want to do it society wants us to do it and you know if we're you know we're talking about entrepreneur and hustle culture you know that's like it's pretty much like go like you know i think a lot about like grant cardone he's like you ain't nothing unless you're at 100 million i'm like okay so that's half of a percent of the, of the world. I'm like, all right, that's an interesting message that you want to do and you want to say there. And Hey, if you're a Cardone guy, I get it. Go, go, go after it, go do it. Um, so for the other 99 and a half percent of us, you know, um, wherever we currently are at, let's, let's jump back in here, right? You're, you're trying to make it work. You have this financial pressure. You have this desire to create something new. You're an approval addict. So you're just like, oh, I can solve your problems to whatever client comes in the door. You're putting in overtime. Then what happens? Well, I mean, it just, it just cratered and it, and it, and it, and it was, it was cratering while she was still pregnant with my, you know, my eight, my now 18 year old. And, uh, I, I kept it in cause I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to impact that. Right. And, um, I haven't really talked about that too much, but. Um, and then, you know, he's born and then literally within six weeks. Wait, what, what do, what don't you want to talk about? Well, just, just how I knew it was over, um, you know, while she was pregnant and, uh, but I wasn't, I mean, cause I'm the one that bolted. Right. And, um, and so it was about, you know, six weeks after that, after he was born and she, I just, she's like, what is up? I'm like done. And she was done but she was in a, you know, two little kids. Right. Um, so she picks up, goes to Destin, Florida because her parents are down there. I'm still in Colorado. She ends up moving to Atlanta, Georgia. Then we get divorced. And then, um, I get seduced by my second and last wife, Marlo. <laughs> She's not here to defend herself. Anyway, she seduces me, Jay. Um, I'm just a poor victim, <laughs> anyway. So, no, anyway, I'm, we, seeing, we... I'm seeing the mindset here <laughs> of the time. I'm getting it. I'm seeing the mindset of the time. Let's. All right. So, anyway, you got this so, divorce, right? So you're going through yeah, this. So, so, so Marlo and I connect, and it's like it's you know, like duh, we're meant to be like you know. So anyway, so so we get married, and then she walks into, and and I was you know winning trophies. I looked successful, but financially she didn't know that I was $250,000 in credit card debt because I had to pay my ex for half my business. I signed a stupid office lease um, that I can't afford. My guys aren't paying me. We're starting to enter the great recession, 2006, 2007. And I'm paying my ex-wife $5,200 at the beginning of every month for alimony and child support because I felt so guilty. I just, I caved in the divorce. Like I just, I was like, <clears throat> whatever you want. Like, I mean, I kind of negotiated a little bit. My attorney was so pissed because she wanted me to do all sorts of things. And I, and I wanted my ex to stay at home. Um, which hindsight was an amazing decision, um, even though it was financially bad. And anyway, so I'm, you know, working hard, working 80, 90 hours a week. And, but, and my wife is Marlo's like, Hey, I want to manage the finances. Hey, what's going on with the finances? And I'm like, no, I got it. Right guys. Right. I got it. Um, but I didn't have it, you know, cause I'm a CPA and a financial advisor. So I got it. She was a hairstylist and then was in sales and then she became a financial advisor. Like, what does she know? I got it. 
And then finally, I'm like, dude, you need some answers. So this, this was one of the turning points, Jay, is pretty substantial. So we're living in this house, central Denver, freezing, like the windows from, were from like the 1950s. And it's small. And, it's, and so I'm like, all right, I got to start meditating. I got to get my brain quiet. So I'm in the garage in February in a ski jacket meditating. <laughs> Why did you, what, how did you learn this? Like, where did this, um, it kind of feels, it feels a bit out of left field. So oh, got it. why did, where, why did meditation, well, why did that come be, into the picture? Because, uh, because I, I'm on a personal development quest, right? Because okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on a personal growth and development journey. Like I, I'm still like, Oh, I got this, but I'm like, I, I still need to understand some things. Right. And so I'm reading and doing, you know, seminars on it. Like, Hey, get your brain quiet. Listen to intuition. Right. Got it. And so I'm sitting there and it was like, let her do it. That was, let her manage the money. That was, hmm. that was the intuitive hit. And in hindsight, you know, the, the famous Mel Robbins five second rule, right? If you don't, if you don't take action in five seconds, your brain start your ego starts talking out of it. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I got up out of the meditation. I come in. I say, hey, it's yours. Here's the checkbook. Here's the bank statements. And let's meet when you're ready. And so about a week later, Jay, I'm in the I'm in the kitchen. And you can sense when you're wife is staring at you you can feel this this pre this presence right and and i turn around and she's there and she's got checkbooks in one hand bank statements in the other hand and she's got this look on her face that's just like what the hell i'm like what, what's the matter she's like what did you do what did you do mm -hmm. Like how, what you're, you're a CPA, Chris, we're $250,000 in credit card debt. You're using debt to keep our office open. You're using debt to keep our lives afloat. You're running out of places to borrow. We're, we're $4,000 negative monthly. Like this is bad. And I'm like, oh crap. So then we had to come to Marlowe meeting. And she introduced this four letter word called a budget. <laughs> right? And uh, optimism and delusion. I'm like, well, but I, I got this happening. I got this happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. 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 And so fast forward about six months later, now we're having to live in a rented house and I'm having to pay my ex-wife. It's, it's the end of the month, $5,200 the next day. I'm like, I don't have it. I don't have the money. I can't borrow. I have no place to go. And I didn't get paid enough. And so I, I go home. I'm like, she made Christmas, man. The only way I can pay my ex-wife is I have to convince Marlo to give me the money. And that was, we call it the purse throwing incident, Jay, because that I asked her. I'm like, I need, I got to pay her. You got money. I don't. And she lost it. That was it. And volcanic Marlowe erupted. We had the fight of all fights. And then I said, well, why are we still married? She goes upstairs to figure out, should she stay or should she go? And there I was. And it was one of the most enlightening moments of my life because I was like, oh my God, I created it all. My ex-wife never had a chance. My kids haven't seen me in nine months. I created the debt. I did this. I did this. Another dominoes falling. And I'm and and I said, wherever I, wherever I've had a problem, Jay, I've always been there. And it was the first time I took a hundred percent responsibility. I'm like, I gotta change. I gotta change. And so Marlon and I got back together the next day and she said, I'm staying. We're staying married. We're not declaring bankruptcy. We're not getting jobs. We're not getting divorced. And she got on planes, trains, and automobiles and interviewed wealthy couples to figure out like what they do and how they think. 
and then we wrote a book called Couples Money in 2011. And and then she looked at me and she said, you know, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to figure out how this keeps creating this. How my mindset keeps creating these horrible results. Because there's a reason why dad's broke, mom's broke, grandma's broke, grandpa's broke. And even though I'm a CPA and a financial advisor, I'm broke. And she's like, so what is that? What, what, is that, you... what does that mean? Let me, let me finish this part and then, and then we'll then yeah, I'll yeah, stop. Yeah. And she said, what does that mean? I'm like, I'm all in. I'm all in on changing. I'm all in like an Olympic athlete is with their sport, honey. This We are not coming back here again. I'm getting up early. I'm visualizing, imaging, journaling. If you would have told me to stand on my head for an hour, I would have done it. But I'm like, I'm all in at shifting my belief systems. Primarily, my focus was on money. But it ended up bleeding into every area of my, our lives. And then what happened is uh, it didn't happen overnight, but it happened over time. We had a jaw dropping financial transformation, just mm. unbelievable blessings and obviously still continues today. And so anyway, so that there's the story. <laughs> what did you, uh, so this is great. Cause I think if we look at the current statistics of, of where we are in time, uh, the number of people that went from paycheck to paycheck, I think that's the specific statistic was like Gen Z and millennial, millennials went from 40% to 60%. So it's increased, right? The, the, the hardship is here. I'm curious. So we have this, we have this situation, like right? we know where you're at. I'm curious about as a father, you take, you're taking this full responsibility. You're, you have this great partnership because your wife is figuring out X, X part of the equation. You've decided to double down and figure out Y part of the equation. So you've now built this great partnership, but you're figuring this out together. What did you do to mend and grow your relationship with your kids? Um, well, I mean, in a, it, I mean, the, 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 the transformation was, you know, from a couple standpoint is, is most couples don't know what the other one wants. And that was my first marriage. There's a, a assumption. And as you know, all, all failure in relationships stand, stems from an, ex, an expectation gap. And so, you know, we had an expectation gap, but Marlon and I sat down and we set a unifying couples goal, right? And it was to save a hundred grand. We were broke, right? That was the goal. And we spent probably an hour talking about why, right? Cause, cause most people, when they set goals, they think it's logical. No, man, it's emotional. If you don't put gas in a Ferrari, the vehicle is not going to go anywhere. And the emotion, the gas, the emotion is, is, is really the why, the compelling emotional reasons. And so we talked about why. And she's like, I hate financial stress. It's impacting me physically. Um, I'm like, I see that. And there's nothing worse when a man feels like he's not bringing it for his family. I mean, it's, it's like caveman, cavewoman. Caveman had to go hunt and gather. Cavewoman wants security. I mean, it's inherent in, in us. I wasn't delivering. That hurt. So that was that was a reason to move, to, to get out of being an approval addict, to not worry about what other people are thinking. And I said, honey, I got to have a relationship with my kids. Like, I, it's just, it just has to happen. And I must, 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 must have the, the financial resources to do it. And so that became compelling. She's like, I'm, all, all, I'm, on, I'm on board with that. We got to deliver the goods, brother. Amen. Right? So, you know, I, I mean, I, I can't teach things I'm not doing. I know that, that I know the, I know the challenge is getting handed to me because I'm meant to do this. Right? I, I know it. God's handed me the challenge. And so the, the, the kids were transformational in my juice. Right, because I needed to spend time with them. I, I needed to get down there every five or six weeks with them. And even though they were at a distance, once I finally accepted that um, and quit beating myself up over that and quit feeling guilty over that, 
because, right, I just need to accept the situation. Otherwise, it was never going to change. And then it was, it was just communi- it was communicating that, you know, and telling my kids, like, hey, I'm not here all the time. But dang, guys, I freaking love you. I'd do every- anything for you. And you know what? Just because I'm not here doesn't mean I don't love you because I do. And I also communicated, hey, dad's working on some stuff. And, you know, um, I'm going to I'm going to make it up to you guys. Right. Damn it. And dude, I did. Where are you at now? How's your how's relationship now? Where are they at? Um, Like what what did you build? I mean, it, it, incredible relationship. I mean, they're 21 and 18. I mean, they're just the freaking brilliant kids. They're both at Vanderbilt. Um, they're just, yeah, they got their mom's brains. Uh, I have to like stare at a page for four hours. They just like snap. Um, you know, their mom did a miraculous job. World class mom. And stepdad's a total star as well. And, um, no, they're thriving. And then my, my 21-year-old got an internship at Google when he was 19. He, uh, he's he been working full-time for a startup in New York for, you know, doing school part-time. Like, he's just humble, busts his ass, no entitlement, cares about people. And, and my 18-year-old's just phenomenal. He's a freshman there, too. But, no, it, dude, it's, uh, it's amazing. And I was... I mean, I miss things, but getting financially secure enough to go see them and do things and pay for their experiences, but be there. And when I was there, I was there. It created a tremendous amount of memories, but I've never heard my kids say my dad wasn't around. Dad Mm -hmm. didn't do this. Dad didn't do that. There's no resentment in our relationship whatsoever. Sometimes, sometimes your life is on a plane. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Sometimes your life is you're walking downhill. Things are really easy. Uh, sometimes you're climbing up the hill. Uh, eventually, everything all levels out when you put forth the effort and you start walking forward. Like what I heard was, and this is for any feel good father, right? That you had this, you had a behavior that was the path that you had walked. And it was forcing you into a certain direction. And then you picked a new spot to walk to and you put in the work. And that's like, I don't know if there's a better lesson really there than just it's surmountable. You know, you can, you can make the change. And um, that's awesome. You know, that's great. There was one other thing that we talked about off air. I really want, I really want to hear you talk about it. And there was this other unlock um, when it came to, you know, uh, at, at some point in here, this other unlock and f- forgiveness or something like that. Like there, were, there was something here. Can you tell us, tell me a little bit more about this? Tell us. Yeah. I, so, um, so I, you know, so we, Marlon, and I have that meeting and I'm like, okay, I got to grow. I got to change and all that. And I said, well, I need a coach um, because my way wasn't working. Right? Chris, as my coach used to say to me, Jay, Based on results, how's your way working? <laughs> I hated that question. <laughs> I hated that question. But he, he's like, based on results, right? And so how's your way working, bud? So I, so I hired this coach, and, um, and I hired him because he'd been financially independent forever. He was in his late 70s. So we do our, our first kind of coaching session, and um, we, then we had a weekly check-in. And so we're in, in the coaching session, she said, Hey, I have a homework assignment for you. And I'm like, goody, right? Cause I'm a CPA, right? I love homework. right? And, and I hired him, Jay, cause I thought I needed the, the right strategy, right? The, the, the how to's and all that. And he said, um, you need to forgive your ex-wife. That's your assignment. And I was like, dude, I thought you were in my corner. Like, she's a freaking horrible person. You're like, what are you talking about? Like, and so I'm like, I'm like, what? That's stupid. Like, what is that going to do for me? He said, dude, 
if you don't forgive her, you're going to be a broke joke your whole life. You'll never let your wealth in. And I didn't ask for further clarification on that. I just kind of bought it. And he said, it's, it's, you know, you want to talk about an energy leak, right? Massive energy leak of resentment. How can I get financially independent if I have this energy leak? And so I'm like, okay, how do I do it? He said, when we're done, I want you to pull, grab, grab out a pad of paper. I want you to write her name at the top of the page. And I want you to write down everything you appreciate about her. And I'm like, oh, my God, really? So, Jay, I sat there for an hour staring at her name on a blank pad of paper. And then right about the top of the hour, I wrote, she's a great mom. And then I did it the next day. And I found another thing. And then I did it the next day. And the next day. And the next day. And the next day. And then about a month into it, the average, I'd be on a run, driving in the car. Just run through the list. She's this, 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 this. And, you know, the brain works in these things called neural pathways. And as my perception of her shifted and changed, um, everything that I resented started falling away because what you don't pay attention to atrophies and falls away. And, you know, then it was, hey, text, Merry Christmas. Hey, uh, you know, Happy Mother's Day. Like, thanks for all the things you do for our kids. And so then, you know, created momentum. And, um, and it's, you know, it's been unbelievable, Jay. And, you know, I haven't had a bad thought about her. And, I mean, forever, all I do is just really appreciate her. And my kids are where they are because of that. And um, it's transformational. And as I've done a lot of keynotes in my company, I always committed that I was going to end in forgiveness because I think people are really bad at it. And, mm. and I was coming off, uh, and, and I'll come off stage and people will be lining up and, it's all they want to talk about is that Jay. They're like, wait, you're telling me the reason I'm stuck in my business is because of that, 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 that. And then my favorite story and I'll be done is, um, I was doing like a full day workshop in Texas with a group of advisors and I finished the morning session on forgiveness and this whole story. And then there's lots of great stories that have come from that, that wouldn't have happened if I didn't do that exercise. And this guy comes up to me, 62 years old. He said, you're telling me, that I have to forgive my ex-wife. I'm like, based on results, <laughs> how's your way working? He's like, I believe you. Wait here. He went in the parking lot. And I was talking to other people. He came back 30 minutes later, Jay. Snot on his shirt. I mean, like, just his eyes were puffy. And he just looked at me with a look I'll never forget. And... He looked 10 years younger, and uh, he gave me a hug, kissed me on the cheek, walked out the door, and never saw him again. Um, unbelievable. I love the part you're saying, like, the, the, the idiom is, like, what you focus on expands. And if you're stuck in the hurt and you're stuck in the suck and you're stuck in the negativity around a person and you're calling forth – those bad things. It's like, how can you help but see that? And your path to forgiveness is active. Your path to forgiveness was let's paint a positive picture. Let's paint an appreciative picture of the, of the target of my forgiveness. And that, um, that active versus path passive role, I think is amazing. Right? I think that that's something that any, any feel good father could absolutely uh, start applying now into their life. Um, You've got you've got something big coming on. You got this big this big book. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, finished it uh, about two weeks ago. Jay, I've been writing for fourteen months, and um, it uh, had a a personal development guru, one of my mentors, a guy named Steve Siebold, reach out to me late uh, twenty twenty one. He's like, I've heard you speak in my company for years, dude. You got to write a book. And uh, your content, my coaching. And he's sold three and a half million books. He's a, he's a legend. And I've been mentored by some of the greatest people around. And so we spent nine months on the first draft. Um, and on the fourth draft, he spent 25 hours making sure that it flowed 
the stories were tight. There was no fluff, but basically the book is called Think and Grow You. And it's uh, the subtitles, How to Get Out of Your Own Way and Level Up Your Life. But it's, it's basically these 50 concepts of very tight teaching, like forgiveness is a chapter, right? Um, but my stories, but it's action steps and resources I did to get out of my own way to shift. And there's, there's five pillars. One is, pillar one is get out of your own way. <laughs> And the awareness of our patterns that keep us stuck. Second is shifting. How do I actually shift to think different, take different actions, different results? Relationships is a pillar. That's a big one because we can't have a great life if our relationships aren't working. Um, game planning. There's to-dos, steps. My coach said you're a great goal setter. You're a horrible goal achiever. Um, and so he really taught me how to set targets and go after them. And then, and then the last one's really the dream and the clarity of, of what it is that you want. But no, man, I'm, I'm excited. The feedback has been amazing. I think it's going to help uh, a tremendous amount of people and uh, just really, really juiced about it. Where can they find it? Uh, so uh, thinkgrowyou.com will take you right to the book. Um, another way is as chrisfelton.me. And uh, there's, there's different things that there are some keynote speaking and workshops in the book and some, some great, uh, great resources for people. Awesome. That'll be all down in the description. Uh, Chris Felton, everybody.